thanks for the intro, Remy. Um, I just have to say that I've been to this conference twice with a diversity scholarship and once with, with a student ticket. So um, if it weren't for FFConf's generosity and commitment um, to creating a diverse community, I wouldn't be the developer I am today. So thanks to all the team for that. Um, hi, I'm Charlotte. Uh, by day, I'm mostly a front-end developer at a startup in London, but by night and on Thursdays and Fridays and the weekends, um, I make generative art and find ways of making that into physical art. So today I'm going to talk about a few of my projects that cross that boundary um, and hopefully show you some ways that you can make, use your coding skills to make physical stuff as well. Um, but first, uh, why should we even use computers to make art at all? Um, especially physical art, you think that Art is like a very expressive process, and adding this complicated, like very binary middle step seems kind of incongruous. Um, but I want to argue that computers are actually better adapted to the design process than any kind of traditional artistic medium. Um, like in this cycle, if I was building like a rocking chair or something, every iteration, I'd have to build the thing from scratch. Uh, but with code, you can build off what you already have and you can make as many copies as you like along the way. And I think we often forget how bloody marvelous that is. Like, imagine building a rocking chair and immediately getting infinite variations of that rocking chair. That's basically what we have with code. Um, and similarly, making physical things from code usually involves writing code to tell a machine how to make something, which is still a whole, le lost, <laughs> a whole lot less laborious um, than carpentry is. Uh, so I'm going to start off by talking about some humble CSS. There definitely hasn't been enough CSS today. Um, there's this perception that generative art is very JavaScript heavy, very math heavy, um, and that definitely can be true, uh, but I want to lower that barrier and show you that you can make generative art with just CSS and also kind of prove it to myself that that's possible. So um, I hope that's big enough to see. This is just a random demo of 100 white squares um, with a black circle in them, which is twice the size of the, of the square. Um, so because of the default positioning, the black circle is in the top left of every square, which creates this kind of white triangular cutout thing. Um, this is already showing a key quality of code that makes generative art possible, by the way. Uh, we only have to write the styling for like that one grid item, and it styles all of these squares. Um, forget that I had to write div 100 times. <laughs> Uh, repeatability is the key quality of computers that makes generative art possible, but doing the same thing over and over again only gets you so far. Um, there needs to be some sort of genesis. Um, with generative art, that's often randomness or some user input like touch, uh, but I don't want to make CSS art, you have to hover over. Um, but there is this one pseudo class that makes things kind of interesting, nth child, ta-da! Um, <laughs> This is, hasn't made that very interesting yet. Um, this is just <laughs> changing the position to be on the right for every second square, uh, which just makes these semicircles. But if I change that 2n to 3n, you get this pattern. And I think that's starting to look kind of interesting. Um, you can see it, still see it's a grid of squares, but there's something much more alive about it. And uh, that's what the joy of generative art is. It's about getting these unexpected outputs from just by like tweaking the input. It's a visual result you didn't expect from literally three extra lines of code. Uh, and we can keep going with this. This one, I've added a, another nth child modifier, which changes the, so basically like every sixth one will now be in the bottom right, every third one will be on the right, every third, every second one will be on the bottom. You don't really need to get what's going on. It just looks pretty. Um, this feels really different to me from the previous one. Uh, and yeah, we can just, we just flip them over and it makes a very different thing again. Um, and with this one, I'm using three and four and you just get such different patterns each time. Uh, I was playing around with this for a while and trying different amounts of rows and columns, and I thought, like, this is art that I'm weirdly proud of, and I kind of want to show off. Um, I think it would look really cool, like, etched into glass or something like that, um, but this is, like, a back-to-basics project, uh, so I thought I'd keep it low-level. Turned on my HP Envy 5540, press Command-P. <laughs> uh, we're going to get on to some really cool machines that make digital, physical art. Um, but I want to take a moment for the humble desktop printer. It's definitely the most accessible machine I'm going to talk about. I think most people have access to a desktop printer, and if not, like it's like 10p for an A4 black and white sheet in a print shop. Um, and with this, I just printed them out, sandwiched them between some thin pieces of acrylic I got, I got off Amazon, put a nail on the wall, hung them on binder clips. Very easy art. Um, this was opposite the door in my old studio, and genuinely, every time I opened the door, it made me so, so happy every time I saw them. It's 
it was like felt really creative and it looks really like, looks really interesting. It's made these interesting shape combinations, even though each of them was about 20 lines of code. I think the physical presence the, the physical presence of having something you've made decorating your space is really powerful and it like clearly doesn't have to cost a lot. Um, besides making cool abstract decorations, I think printing is really useful to give context to a project. It's really easy to forget that computers are constantly mode switching. Um, they're the most transient element of our 21st century lives. Uh, there's really no permanence in what you're seeing on a screen. So even though mentally you may remember that this variable will result in this output or this page will lead to this page if you click this link, you can't really get a stable view of that and all the different like, contexts and stages of a project unless you materialize it somehow. Um, I like to go so far as to printing entire websites. <laughs> Um, this was a client project I was working on, but they had a lot of mismatched styles, um, and I was building a component library for them. Everyone thought I was like, being really excessive when I printed out the whole thing, but it was the only way to get the bigger picture of what was going on. Um, so I'd like to encourage you all to print things off more. You can like, offset the carbon some other way. <laughs> uh, and that, yeah, wasting paper leads me nicely onto pen plotting. Firstly, how soothing is this? Um, I took this video the other day uh, when I was making some art for my new studio's walls, and I just sat and watched it for like a good 45 seconds. 45 seconds? 45 minutes. 45 seconds is like the length of time you're going to watch it. Um, I'll just leave that there to hypnotize you. Uh, so pen potters are mechanical drawing devices. Generally, they have like an X and a Y axis and some sort of device to, to lift and drop a drawing implement. That's the alt tag of this video. Um, they were especially popular in the 70s and 80s for large format printing, for like architectural and engineering drawings, um, but they kind of fell out of favor when inkjet printers became cheaper and more efficient. Um, in the last couple of years, though, generative artists and hackers have realized how dang cool they are, um, and they've had a bit of a comeback. A lot of models from the 80s still remarkably work, which is amazing, but I think they've sort of dried up on eBay. Uh, there's a company in the US called Evil Mad Scientist who make these high quality models. Um, they're geared like specifically towards digital artists and people have to sign their autograph a lot like Dan Brown and Dan Abramov. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, someone got my joke. Um, there's quite a wide spectrum of these pen plotters available. Like uh, Kickstarter is completely rife with them. Um, and some are on the cheaper side, but as far as I can see, nothing matches the build quality and consistency of the Axie Draw. Um, I bought this one about six months ago and I love it. Um, this is the A3 Axie Draw. It costs about 550 quid. Um, which is a fairly hefty investment for hobbyists, I'll admit. Um, but, you know, my family are going to love it when they get all customized, handwritten, um, illustrated Christmas gifts. <laughs> uh, for me, this is the kind of device that really encourages me to be creative because I think the output is really tantalizing. Um, I was saying before about how the, the digital world is distinct from the physical world because it's like perfectly accurately repeatable. Um, but that's kind of a shame sometimes because it doesn't leave any room for serendipity in code. You're always going to get the same result every single time. But with pen plotting, you can have like a, a very detailed millimeter perfect drawing, and yet you're still going to get these spots where like the pen over inks when it hits the paper or like the paper stock is, is a little bit off um, and the, the lines aren't perfectly smooth. And I think that's, that's really beautiful. Uh, when you look at a piece from a pen plotter, you can feel the hours that have gone into it. I think there's something really special about that, about being able to see that effort, even if it's, even if it's not a human effort. So um, throughout this talk, I'm going to have a few practical tips uh, to point you in the right direction if you want to dip your toes into this area. Um, so first practical tip, uh, test everything on rubbish paper first. If you're planning on getting into pen plotting, um, get some cheap, thin paper as well as like your nice paper that you want to hang on the walls. Um, I can't count how many times I've just completely messed something up by the pen not being at the right height or the scale of the drawing being wrong or something in the setup being funky. Um, and that's, that's very, very painful. Um, to avoid having to do the entire plot twice, I have a, like a template that I use to calibrate the machine. Um, it draws like a, a crop line one centimeter in so I can see that it's angled properly. Uh, some lines across the page to make sure it's like even everywhere, and then I tend to draw like one bit of the thing I want to draw just to make sure it's like coming out properly and has got the right like pen I'd want, that kind of thing. Practical tip number two um, is use this NPM package uh, Canvas to SVG for easy vector outputs from Canvas drawings. Uh, so this 
is an illustration <laughs> that uh, does pretty much the same thing as the one we saw earlier in CSS, but using the Canvas API um, in JavaScript. And yeah, lots more maths. It's not very readable. Don't really worry about it. Um, I just kind of played with the variables until I got a pretty pattern. <laughs> Canvas allows us to use the GPU to draw primitives really performantly directly into an HTML element. Um, here we're using quadratic curves, if you can see some quadratic curve too. Uh, but then, yeah, you can, draw, you can draw rectangles, lines, other types of curves, and then either fill them, uh, which is like background color, or stroke them to outline them. Um, and layering those up is how uh, like half of the cool generative art you see is made. Um, so here we use the Canvas element. Uh, and get the rendering context of that element, um, rendering context of that element, and um, then all of the drawing methods are applied to that context. Uh, the canvas element is a raster output, though, so you can right-click it and hit save, and it'll treat itself as a PNG, um, which is cool for saving your output if you want to, say, print it out. Um, but if you want to use a pen plot or a laser cutter or something like that, you'd need a vector format to tell the pen where to go. So that's where this comes in, uh, this Canvas SVG package, because you get to, you, you just define a, um, a context uh, with the same width and height as you would have had your Canvas, uh, and it has all of the same methods of the, as the 2D Canvas rendering context, um, so you just treat it exactly the same, but then it can output serialized SVG, uh, which is great. Here I'm using a, a little file saver utility um, but you can also just render it onto the page as inline SVG. Um, and yeah, this also works on Node Canvas. Uh, so if you want to do that on a server, I, I don't know why you want to do that, but you can. <laughs> cool. Next up, laser cutting. Um, firstly, I just want to talk about jigsaw puzzles for a while. Um, <laughs> this uh, lovely, colorful thing in the background um, is an evolution of one of the per first pieces of generative art I ever made. Uh, it's not the most complex piece of art ever imagined. Um, it just has, it had some like colorful circles that kind of wandered around and left this, this duotone trail. Uh, but ever since I made it, I thought it would make a really good design for a jigsaw puzzle. Um, so for the last two years, I've been very sporadically working on making a generative jigsaw puzzles, an actual product you can buy. Um, honestly, not too far along with it. Uh, but if you want to follow along, you can sign up with my mailing list, Abstract Puzzles. Um, the challenge of designing jigsaws is about balancing like simplicity and complexity in the design. You want there to be, you want like every single piece to be unique, but you also want there to be an obvious way of grouping the pieces. And I think abstract art, generative abstract art, is a really fun way of fulfilling both of those things. Uh, and plus, the idea of every instance being unique like really tickles me. And uh, yeah, the, the other element of making generative jigsaw puzzles is choosing how to cut the pieces. Uh, this is why I love generative coding so much, because you get to be super creative and expressive making generative art. But this is more like generative design. There's, there's a framework that you have to work within, uh, be that material limitations or something like this, which is a product convention. We all know what jigsaws look like. Uh, and then you get to come up with creative solutions through problem solving. I don't know if anyone here has ever written an algorithm to randomly generate jigsaw puzzles. Anyone? Okay, this is what you're spending your weekends doing. It is genuinely it's so much fun. Um, most jigsaw puzzles uh, you can buy are made of recycled cardboard, and they're cut with a metal die. So imagine like a giant pastry cutter that just kind of like stamps it out. So a lot of jigsaw companies will only have like a handful of these dies in different sizes because like they can last tens of thousands of cuts before they, they dull. Um, the downside of that is that you can't vary the design between puzzles, because obviously each die has got a set shape. Um, but the alternative to that is laser cutting. Uh, yeah, by the way, I developed all of those things in browser, just like the pen plotting example, canvas to SVG for the vector outputs, um, and then just like normal canvas for the raster outputs. Um, you may be able to tell from this incredibly smoky video that I'm still working out the kinks in this method of production. Uh, <laughs> making things is, is very rewarding, but um, often super difficult and frustrating because you don't know what sort of complexity is going to be thrown your way, either from the material processes or, um, or the methods of the production. Uh, like with this, I wanted to use 6 millimeter MDF, which is a, a wood composite, um, because it's a consistent material all the way through, and uh, six mil is like nice and chunky for, for a jigsaw. Um, but it's hard to burn through that density of wood 
without it getting really smoky. And usually that's not a problem because you might like spray paint something you've laser cut or not care what it looks like. Uh, but with this, I obviously have like a printed puzzle stuck onto it. So you don't want to smoke damage that. And then it's like, what, um, what paper do you use to do the puzzle? What kind of ink do you have on that? What's the process of the printing of that? What like a bonding agent are you using to stick that to the wood? Do you want it face up or face down to like avoid the smoke? You know, there, there was like so many variables there. Um, but, you know, just like code, if you keep trying, if you keep trying, it's not as instant as, as you know, bug fixing code, uh, but, you know, eventually it's all, it's all figure outable. Um, I've been cutting puzzles out of MDF and, and plywood as a test, uh, but you can always cut all sorts of materials um, and they each bring different properties to the table. Uh, this was a project inspired by a place called Cape Coral in Florida, um, which is wild. If you ever look at a satellite image of, of Cape Coral, it has 400 miles of navigable waterways. So every single house is on a canal. It is just crazy. Um, it looks like a maze. So I, I made a maze. Um, <laughs> and then I made some sort of like spilling algorithm to see uh, how the water disperses among the waterways. Um, and then I laser cut it out of paper. Um, by the way, Mazes, also really fun, interesting generative design challenge. Um, there's an excellent book uh, on the topic called Mazes for Programmers by Jamis Buck. I uh, would highly recommend that if anyone wants to get into puzzles. So many algorithms involved in, in, in maze generation. It's fascinating. Um, but yeah, paper's really fun to laser cut because um, it gets very, very neat edges. You can do very, very intricate patterns um, with like zero effort because it goes really quickly because it's so easy to burn through. Um, and they look amazing when, when you layer them up. So you can really take your shadow puppetry to the next level. Um, the downside of paper is it's also really delicate. I didn't really think about that when I cut literal maze out of paper. This, can you imagine picking this up? Because it was extremely, extremely difficult. Uh, I also did some material tests for this on foam board, which came out quite interesting as well. Uh, foam board is card sandwiched between foam. Foam sandwiched between card whichever way around that works. Um, so here, the, the laser uh, cut through the foam a lot more easily than the card, which meant the foam kind of melted back in this like weird retracting way, which altered the depth of certain areas. Um, so I thought this was really cool. So if you're ever doing some laser cutting, just try whatever materials you have around. I'm sure you get some interesting results. Um, this isn't actually generative art, uh, but I just wanted to show that you can also etch on a laser cutter, which can leave interesting effects um, on acrylic and on wood. So this was a quick drawing I did. It was just like thick marker pen on a piece of paper, scanned it in, uh, brought it into Illustrator, just drew around the outlines, and then I etched the scan into the wood and then cut the outlines on there. Um, and then I put them on a flatbed scanner and rearranged the pieces to bring them back into a digital space. And that kind of like interplay of digital and physical, I think is really exciting. Um, you can use tech to further your art, art to further your tech, because um, they can kind of complement each other really well. Um, practical tip for laser cutting, uh, get access at a Hackspace university or pay by the art facilities. Laser cutters are exorbitantly expensive. Um, the one I had access to at uni cost, I think, 60,000 um, pounds. You can get cheap ones as low as 200 pounds these days, but I would not recommend that. Uh, lasers are very dangerous, um, and they also should have proper ventilation. Uh, so also, also, if you get a cheap one, the laser is less powerful, so it'll take longer to cut. Um, so, you know, lots of trade-offs. Um, you can get decent laser cutters from a couple brand, but you're still probably better off just finding access to a good one. If you're a member of a university that has any kind of, uh, like, design department, they'll probably have a good one with a, like, dedicated technician. And usually, even if you're not in the design department, you can request an induction to it. So that's an option. Uh, otherwise, there are hacker spaces like across the whole globe that have tons of equipment, like woodworking, metalworking, you name it. Um, they're often subscription-based, so you pay like 30 quid a month, um, sometimes with like a nominal hourly fee for using the laser cutter. Uh, but they're also very community-oriented, so it's a good place to learn new skills and, and meet like-minded people as well. Uh, there are also plenty of places that just charge by the hour for a laser cutter, so you're just left in a room. You have to know how to laser cut before they let you do that. Um, but yeah, that's what I'm doing at the moment. It's, it's pretty great. Uh, my second practical tip, test-driven development. Still applies here. Um, you, you may think that you can just like grab some wood and have an idea and just go laser cut the perfect jigsaw puzzle. No, nope, it <laughs> doesn't work like that. I tried. Um, Lasers have uh, power and speed options. Um, they'll usually be, next to a laser cutter, like a list of recommended settings for different types of common materials, um, but you can't really trust them. 
um, even like on the same laser bed, a laser might like work at, at one end and not at the other end. It's really odd. Um, so I strongly suggest like get a few materials, go test them out, just cut a load of circles with different settings to see what works, so that when you're you know making your main piece, you can be confident that it's gonna it's gonna cut the way you want it to. Ramping up now, 3D printing. So I want to tell you about this project. Um, it's my favorite thing I've ever made. Uh, and it started really small with this. Um, but first, let me tell you a bit about my background for context. Uh, I studied jewelry design and silversmithing at university. That may be where this obsession with material things came from. Uh, but while I was doing that, I was always working on the side as a web developer. Um, so when I like, finished that bachelor's degree, I was kind of leaning towards a career in web. Uh, jewelry industry is very hard to get into, and I was also kind of an okay web developer. Um, but I was sort of unsatisfied with my creative output on the web. Uh, I love the problem-solving aspects of making websites, but it was really missing something like tactile that, that I, I got from jewelry. Um, so I found this uh, master's course at Goldsmiths in London called Computational Arts, um, which was really cool. It's all about using computers more creatively, um, bringing in other things like audio and robotics and making physical things like I've been talking about. Um, so decided to do that. Uh, we had a class um, in our first term uh, by a PhD student about modeling <coughs> biological phenomena. Um, and at the end of the first, our first like, term with him, um, he was like, just go make something for your final project. It just has to be within a screen, but you can kind of do like, whatever language, whatever inspiration, you can do whatever you want. Uh, so I decided I wanted to combine three things that interested me. Um, the first is, is this. I might just go back soon and, and forward again so you can see from the start. This is Conway's Game of Life. Any fans of Conway's Game of Life in the audience? Yeah. Oh, that's like a, that was like a good 25% of you. That makes me happy. Uh, so Conway's Game of Life is a, um, a simulation of evolution. Very simple. Um, it's a Cartesian grid of cells that are either on or off. And um, each generation, each frame, um, they turn off or on or on or off based on the amount of active cells around them. So a cell can like die of starvation or overpopulation, but they can also like generate from having the right amount of active cells around them. So it's kind of basic, um, but it achieves this like really interesting equilibrium quite quickly. Um, and you can see there are like some bits that are stable because they're just yeah all, all bits that are in flux. Do we have any other line ones? Very cool. So I want to do that uh, with hexagons because I love hexagons. I thought they have um, they have more sides, so that will make <laughs> that will make this more interesting. Um, yeah, it wasn't perfect, and annoyingly, the magical thing about Conway's Game of Life is that th there's like a s settings, and then it will just kind of keep going forever. Like you've got, it's really hard to end up with a stable Conway's Game of Life. Uh, with hexagons, it would either completely overpopulate or um, or just like end up with nothing. So sadly, this has a little bit of genesis. Like they randomly turn on a little bit, um, but you know, it still looks kind of cool. Uh, the other thing I wanted to combine it with uh, is this thing from the Generative Gestaltung book. Um, did I say that right? No Germans in the audience, great. Um, so uh, generative, it's a generative design book, really chunky book of amazing examples of generative art and generative design. Um, if you're interested in this kind of thing, I'd really recommend it. It's so inspiring. So this is one thing that they had in there that was just a grid, um, and you could draw on it, but it would, like, the glyphs in each kind of space um, would be chosen depending on what was active around it. Um, so you could just like draw a random shape and it would look really interesting because of the way that the lines connected. So I wanted to basically do that in hexagons on Conway's Game of Life. <laughs> um, so this was demo number one. Actually, I think this was demo number three. Um, uh, I think it's making some really interesting shapes already, actually. Uh, like. But they just they kind of flash and disappear. There's also this like triangular subgrid that's developing, which is kind of kind of weird. Um, I found that the like game of life rules made it move too quickly, so I kind of made them made them fade out a bit. Um, my next stage was uh, to add these different layouts um, for for the active hexagons because if you had like five active hexagons around the middle one. Um, it would just connect every single edge that it, that it saw, uh, which is a bit overwhelming, but I kind of made a few different versions for each layout that had all of the vocabulary in this is really complicated. <laughs> it's a layout, yeah. Um, so, they, they, and then they would randomly pick which one to assign 
when a, when a thing got made active. Um, I also introduced the idea of, instead of our oh, contrast is on here, you can't really see the one that's making it, but um, I introduced the idea of a creator-destroyer relationship. Um, Game of Life was a bit too, it was just happening a bit too quickly. So this, there's, there's one hexagon that leaves a trail behind it, and there's another one that goes and deletes, um, deletes things, but that one seems to be really <laughs> failing right now. It's over there somewhere. <laughs> uh, so that was that stage. Um, next step was adding a uh, double thick state instead of um, in the generative design book it had uh, just like some really like stylized um, glyphs um, and I thought instead of doing that I wanted to make this a bit more visually interesting I decided to like double up the lines instead so now every hexagon can be inactive active or double active um, which makes for some interesting visuals because the lines have to like diverge and converge in a way that's quite interesting. It's still very triangular now though. So um, the next thing was to, was to get rid of the triangles and make it more circular. Um, and yes, I ended up with this. Uh, oh, I, just, I can just watch it for a few minutes. Um, so like the CSS art earlier, these are just results you wouldn't expect from, from adding. Uh, I just kind of like gave some hexagons an idea of how they should you know, draw lines between each other, and you get stuff like this. Um, yeah, gosh, I just love it. Anyway, um, uh, the, the other thing I did here, you can see my mouse, um, I added a, a keyboard um, interaction, which is cool, because it means I could get rid of them and make like a load of creators and see how, how quickly they populated a space, uh, or equally can make a load of one creator and a load of destroyers. So that one's not going to get very far. Um, but what I also did is added this mouse interaction. Uh, so you could just draw things instead of, instead of letting the, the computer do it for you, um, which was very distracting because you could <laughs> <laughs> stand here all day and just draw some work on them. Um, yeah, so I was doing, doing this, and I kind of got to this point of, of being like, oh no, I've made jewellery. <laughs> um, I, I, was, I was trying to escape from this. Um, I, yeah, I think, I think anyone that, that looked at this program thinks, like, just puts whatever they, they know best into it. So I was just, it was inevitable that I was going to be able to find, like, jewellery in this system. I was talking to one guy once. Um, that was, I showed him the app and he was like, oh, this is exactly like these protein strings in my biology <laughs> PhD program. Sure. Um, <laughs> so uh, I realized I had to pursue this. There was no way I could just stop at this point. Um, so, but that, that university project was over, but we could come back for a like, final major project in the summer. You could do whatever you want for it. Uh, so I decided to pick this up again um, and make it into jewelry somehow. Uh, the first step was figuring out like how, like what, what does that mean? What, what jewelry would it be? Um, and I decided to like forego the concept of reality for a while um, and just like make a 3D visualization of exactly what I wanted uh, without being kind of constrained by the idea of actually producing it. Um, so, and I also had to rewrite the whole thing because it was originally written in P5, which is like a JavaScript implementation of processing, which is like a thin layer on top of the Canvas API which I didn't know why I did that. Um, and I also had to change the quadratic Beziers to cubic Beziers for any Bezier fans in the audience. <laughs> um, anyway, so, uh, yeah. Um, so I made this thing. Oh, I also, uh, I kind of really saw them as, as being wire forms. Um, and like the ways they overlapped, I could really imagine how that would happen in, in 3D space. Um, so I made this here. Uh, so the left-hand side is now this space. I want to try and make something beautiful for you, but it's difficult. Um, oh, I just want to start again. Hold on. <laughs> oh, we'll go with that. You also can like hover now to get those different layouts I was talking about, which is quite interesting. Um, and now there's this render button. She does this. It's not loading the, it's, it's not as shiny as it is in, in, my, in my current demo, but um, it's pretty cool. So, um, so yeah, this, it has two different sliders down here, if you can see. Um, this top one 
is for, it's really hard to figure out how you're gonna make lines overlap in like a complete arbitrary system. Um, so I decided on two, two ways of doing it. Uh, this one is, is um, for particular layouts. So like this, this bit here, which is that hexagon there, um, it's obvious that those two lines should always be separated from each other. So the, the first one is like separate the things that would obviously cross over. Um, and the second one is uh, hard to explain. It's bringing, <laughs> it brings up like the middle, the inside line of any of the doubled up bits. If that makes sense. You can kind of see it here if I I'll go back and forth. Anyway. So, um, so now you can sort of also, like design the thing on the canvas, but also like have a play with how it how how deep it is. Um, and this whole thing was written uh, in JavaScript with 3JS, um, which uh, was remarkably easy to integrate. It's just uh, they're just a load of pipes basically. Um, and yay! So I uh, yeah I did the thing. I made the visualization of exactly what I wanted to do. Project over. Nailed it. Um, no no. Now I had to physically make this in jewelry somehow. Uh, the Practical tip, you can export STL files straight from 3JS. This is like really mind blowing. Um, I thought I'd have to like export this weird data of all of these positions of these lines and import them into a 3D modeling program and then do some sort of code in there to, to make it into something. Um, but there is an add-on for 3JS, which means you can export STL files directly from there. Um, STL files are like uh, 3D object files that store the object as triangulated surfaces, so you can use them straight in 3D printer software, uh, which is really radical because it means as JavaScript developers, if you're a JavaScript developer, um, you don't even need to touch like SketchUp or Blender or anything. You can make, you can do 3D modeling in the browser and then have it print out, which is very cool. Uh, the next thing is thinking about how I print the thing. Uh, there are a whole bunch of different 3D printers. Uh, most commercial 3D printers, uh, non-commercial 3D printers are extrusion based. Uh, so they have a reel of plastic behind them and they melt it and they kind of like poop out as they go in layers. Um, the trouble with that is that I want to make this thing in precious metal. I'm a jeweler. I like, like shiny things. Um, and the normal way to do that in the jewelry world is that you would 3D print the thing and then you would make a, uh, a mold of that in rubber and then you would make a copy of the original thing in wax and then you would use like this traditional jewelry method, lost wax casting to make the thing. But I can't do that with these because they're so delicate, like you wouldn't ever be able to make a mold of them and actually replicate it. Um, so yeah, the ideal thing would be to use this bad boy, <laughs> which is, um, uh, is a direct metal laser, laser sintering machine. Um, this is actually one for steel, but there does exist, I think, several in the world for gold. I've witnessed one firsthand, it's amazing. Um, you may be able to guess from size, extremely expensive though. <laughs> um, so with these ones there, it's like a, a re really thin layer of powder, of like powdered gold, and it will use a laser to just melt the powder and then go down a little bit and put another layer of powder on top of it and then go down and literally then you have your thing perfectly just made out of the metal by melting it with lasers, mind blowing. Um, yeah, I don't have access to that. What I did have access to was, um, was this amazing machine. This is the Formlabs Form 2. Uh, we had a couple at my university um, and this is a stereo lithography printer or SLA. Um, and the way this works is that it cures liquid resin. So it has this build plate that comes in from above, kind of like the opposite way around to the direct metal laser sintering thing. A build plate comes in from above, um, like pool of liquid resin and then a laser underneath that, um, that cures a layer and brings it up, it's more on, and then it, it builds up this thing. The uh, cool thing about this is that it also has wax prototype materials that you can use any kind of liquid resin. Um, and Formlabs, the company that make these, uh, they have a material that is close enough to wax that you can do the jewelry casting thing directly from it, which is just solves all my problems. So yeah, this is the, the first one I 3D printed. Um, the thing behind it is the support structure. So when you're, uh, that's actually upside down on the machine, but when you like, it can't cure in midair, it needs to have something holding it. So that's why it has this kind of support structure holding it all together. Um, and that was too big. My second ones were too fragile and small. But these third ones just were just right, like the Goldilocks of 3D printing. Um, they have, it's like as if the, uh, if it were made of wire, the wire would be one millimeter thick, which is a really um, like 
good size for jewellery in terms of its softness and stuff. Um, and they, they're all just quite sensible size. I'm wearing them. You can, you can just... Um, <laughs> uh, and instead of, like, to save you from me talking about how jewellery is made for 40 minutes, I've got this two-minute video that I will talk over um, so it doesn't get too long. Yeah, so we start with the 3D printing bit, as I have just discussed. Um, the next bit in this video is UV curing it in a, in a UV chamber. I don't actually have to do that anymore because they've updated the material, but it looks baller. Um, so <laughs> uh, and then we cut off the, that support structure I was talking about. And then we have to add these things called sprues. Um, when, you, when you're re basically replacing this with metal, um, you need the metal to be able to get to the end without cooling. Uh, and, you know, so... So these are like little sticks that, that mean that the metal can flow to the end. Um, I now 3D print these, so I don't have to get George to do it anymore. Sorry, George. Um, but yeah, so you end up with this, with this like weird tree-like structure um, where the metal can flow to the end. Uh, these are then put onto a stem um, and, made, and put into a flask, a metal flask, which is taped up and filled with this stuff called investment, which is like really fine plaster. Uh, that is then put in a kiln, and then all of the wax like burns out. So you're left with uh, just a, like a plaster flask um, with like a, a negative for the like where you want the metal to go. It then goes into a casting machine. You can get centrifugal ones or uh, vacuum-based ones. Um, this is where all the metal is melted. This is all sterling silver, uh, and then that gets like forced into the flask. And then you end up with just like a tree of the exact thing you made in silver. This is like how 99% of jewelry is made, by the way. It looks amazing. Um, next step is to cut them off the tree. Um, and then I would take them back to my studio, uh, cut off all of the extra little bits, um, <coughs> sand them, polish them. And then you're, you're left with a quite a nice little piece of jewelry, if I say so myself. Um, I put this on a chain because this is a pendant, but, you know, they can be anything. Uh, so, yay, made some jewellery. Nailed it. Um, <laughs> that wasn't as smooth a process as I made it seem in this video. Um, <laughs> it took quite a while to develop. Uh, but, yeah, so this was at the end of my, um, at my master's course. Uh, I had a exhibition where I showed off the programme um, and all of the, like, some pieces I've made in a, in a nice cabinet. Um, and I really liked that this was, to me, like this tool made me feel really creative and I love the idea of it being a tool to make other people feel creative um, and also to make personalised jewellery, which is like amazing because it's not only you're, you're being creative, you also get a really precious output from it. Um, and I also lost access to my 3D printer because I left university. <laughs> uh, so I ran a Kickstarter campaign uh, to turn this into, into a proper thing I could spend my time on. I don't know why I set the... Um, set the the goal's so high, it, the printer's only three grand, so anyway. <laughs> Mercifully, it was successful. Um, and all of the, the rewards were, were custom pieces of jewellery. So I got to see all of the kind of things that other people would make. This is like most of the custom pieces. Uh, some of them horrendously ugly. A lot of them were quite big. Um, but some really, really shockingly beautiful things. I thought I knew this programme back to back. Um, but there was something here that was just like unlike anything that I patterns I'd seen in it before. So it was really interesting to see people explore like the language of hexatope and you know take time perfecting their design, which is really nice. There was also this um, surprising kinship between a few different pieces. Like these are by completely different people, and they just like go well together. And I think there's something really like harmonious about that. So I love that you can see my bandage with masking tape thumb in the <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, since the, the Kickstarter, I've uh, launched my online shop for Hextape, uh, which you can check out, hextape.io, um, and design something for yourself. Uh, most of the work I've been doing on it recently um, has been on the production side. Uh, because the material on my casting in isn't, like, normal wax that you would cast in, uh, sometimes the quality of the results are a bit inconsistent. So I now own three kilns um, <laughs> and uh, working on it, uh, but we'll be ramping up production as Christmas, Christmas looms closer. Um, also hoping to introduce hexatope earrings and rings, fingers crossed, um, in the not too distant future. Very much not done with this project. Um, so yeah, I thought this. I hope this talk has showed you that it's not too hard to start making physical things with your coding skills, um, but also that like even something that starts as like a really trivial bit of play can actually become a proper physical product that you could sell to people. Um, I've only shown a few different like 
well, some of my projects that are, are using a few different machines. Um, so I want to finish up by talking about a handful of um, really interesting projects in this space that have inspired me massively. Um, first is Nervous System. Uh, they are a pair of incredible artists, programmer, makers from upstate uh, New York. They are my heroes. <laughs> They've been um, making generative jewelry and generative jigsaw puzzles uh, for far longer than me, but we do very different things, I promise. Um, uh, a lot of their work is inspired by nature, and this cup was uh, generated as if like, inspired by a piece of coral, but then, uh, so they 3D print the mold, and then, um, and then use kind of like traditional slip casting techniques to make the thing, which is, which is amazing. Um, I didn't realize that these guys are sponsors of this, of this conference, so if you're here from Unmade, come talk to me. Hello. Um, so, uh, yeah, Unmade uh, work with fashion brands and textile company that provide uh, like the idea of, of mass customization. Um, they think that's, that's going to be the future of, of, uh, of clothing, which is really interesting to see. It. Also, the way it's implemented on the web is, is sick. Um, finally, uh, Glass is like my favorite material to work with ever. MIT have a freaking 3D printer for glass, uh, which is just bananas. So the kind of, like this space of um, like generative production is, uh, you know, really exciting and definitely like going in the right places. Eventually we'll be able to 3D print literally anything and I'm really excited for that. Um, anyway, so that's, that's me. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs>